Good morning, my name is Luke Kennedy and I'm spending some time with the middle primary students. Coming up, we'll learn all about characters in narratives. We'll learn about five digit numbers and we'll hear all about the wonderful sun. So get your thinking caps on and let's get ready to read. Do you have a favourite character from a book, a film or a cartoon? How does an author make a character come to life? In English today, Pascal is going to look at characters in narratives. She's going to explore how authors choose different kinds of language to create rich characters by giving more details about their attributes and actions. Hello. Good authors think about the language they use to create engaging characters and an attention-grabbing plot for their story. They can use adjectives, which are words that describe nouns. Let's think about what I said just now. Authors think about the language they use to create characters and plot for their story. Instead, I included these adjectives and said engaging characters and an attention-grabbing plot. That gives more information and makes it clear that I didn't mean boring characters or a mind-numbing plot. Those adjectives would describe a very different story, wouldn't they? What other kinds of words do authors use? Verbs. You know that verbs are words that show action. Authors choose verbs that build an image in the reader's mind. Let's have a go. Here are a couple of simple doing verbs walk and eat. Well, we can make those actions much more exciting or vivid. How about instead of walk, we said stroll or saunter or plod. And we can do better than eat too. How about nibble or gobble or inhale? Those verbs give us a much clearer picture, don't they? Now we're going to watch the beginning of the story, The Tiger, The Rabbit and Chung Ho. It's a retold tr traditional story from Korea. As we watch, try and see if you can pick up some adjectives and verbs used to describe Chung Ho. Long ago, a weary traveller named Chung Ho was cutting through a deep ravine when he heard a strange voice. Help me, help me. Please, somebody take pity on me. The traveller, being a kind and gentle man, hurried to the sound. Pausing at a clearing, Chung Ho looked down. A tiger peered up at him from the depths of a deep pit. Did you hear any adjectives or verbs that helped to build Chung Ho's character? I did. I heard the adjectives weary, kind and gentle. I also noticed some verbs. Chung Ho was cutting through the ravine and after he heard the tiger's call for help, he hurried over. Let's watch the rest of the story. Wise friend, would you please, please help me get out of this trap? begged the tiger. Oh no, my friend, I won't help you, for if I did, you would eat me alive, stated the cautious traveller. With my hand on my heart, I swear one thousand oaths that I will not hurt you. In fact, forever shall I serve you as your slave if you free me from this death trap. With that, the tiger sobbed and wept, and sobbed and wept some more. Chung Ho, not liking to see any of God's creatures suffer, felt sorry for the tiger. Just to make sure, he made the tiger promise once again not to eat him if he helped him out. With that done, the kind man crouched down and with great difficulty pulled the tiger up out of the pit with a long stick. But no sooner had the tiger surfaced that he began pacing hungrily around poor Chung Ho. I don't have to honour my promise to you as the trap was made by man, the tiger muttered. I have a right to eat you. Besides, I'm terribly hungry. I'll eat you this minute, he snarled licking his lips. Chung Ho pleaded for his life, reminding the tiger of his promise. After much negotiation, the two struck a deal. They would ask the first three things they encountered to decide what should happen.
they first asked the persimmon tree what they should do. After all that man has done to me, ripping off my branches and twigs for wood for his fires, when all along I gave him shade and fruit, you deserve to be eaten, replied the persimmon tree angrily. One down, murmured the tiger. Next they met a buffalo ploughing the field and asked for his opinion. The buffalo pondered the case for a moment. I work long years tilling the soil for man, and how does he repay me? He slaughters me when I'm too old to work. I see nothing wrong with the tiger eating you, he snorted, swishing his tail in disgust. Two down, said the tiger gleefully. Now really shaken with fear, Chung Ho caught sight of a rabbit bounding across the field. Rabbit, come here and settle this for us. You are my last hope. Chung Ho explained his problem. Meanwhile, the pacing tiger was watching closely. The rabbit, however, looked confused and asked Chung Ho to explain what had happened again. The traveller explained the whole story again. I am sorry, said the rabbit. I just don't get what you are telling me, nor do I believe what happened. Now, if we could just go to where this story took place, maybe then I will understand and be a good judge, responded the rabbit. So all three, the tiger, the rabbit, and Chung Ho, returned to the pit where the tiger had been trapped. Now, let's get this straight so my poor brain can understand, said the rabbit, standing over the pit. Who was in the pit? I was, you foolish rabbit, exclaimed the impatient tiger. Now I'm extremely hungry. I'm going to sharpen my teeth and claws, and after that I'll eat you both. Oh dear sir, just one moment while my slow wits come good, responded the rabbit politely. You, dear tiger, were in the pit, and, uh, would you be so kind as to show me how you were in there? Like this, yelled the frustrated tiger, leaping into the pit. Now do you understand, you stupid rabbit? I was in here like this, and this man came along. The rabbit and Chung Ho peered down at him in the pit. Quiet, said the rabbit. With that, Chung Ho and the rabbit wandered off very, very happily. What did you think? That rabbit was pretty clever. Did you notice more adjectives and verbs that helped you understand more about the characters? Here's a selection of adjectives. And here is a selection of verbs. You can see how carefully choosing your words can build a vivid picture for the reader. See you later. Hi everyone, welcome back. It's now time for some maths learning. Today we are thinking about five digit numbers. In this lesson you will see how to use your place value knowledge to recognise and represent five digit numbers in different ways. And you'll see how to locate them on a number line. So let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Monique and I have with me my friend Sally. Hi Sally. Today we are working with five digit numbers. But before we start working with five digit numbers, we need to revise our place value understanding of four digit numbers. The largest four digit number is 9,999. 
it has digits in the thousands, hundreds, tens, and ones place value positions. When we add one to 9,999, we get the number 10,000, which is the first five digit number. Five digit numbers have digits in the 10,000s place value position the thousands place value position and the hundreds, tens and ones place value positions. Now just how many is 10,000? Well, 10,000 is how many cents there are in $100. 10,000 is how many centimetres there are in 100 metres. 10,000 is about how many minutes there are in a week. And 10,000 is how many people would normally go to a sporting event at a large arena. I have placed a five digit number on the place value chart. There is a digit in the 10,000s place value position, thousands place value position, and the hundreds, tens, and ones place value positions. When reading a five digit number, such as the one on the place value chart, it is not read as four ten thousands, eight thousands, nine hundreds and two tens and six ones. It is read as 48,926. You will see some numbers on the screen. Let's read these numbers aloud together. 20,000. 25,832. And one more. 78,001. I have here a five digit number maker to make some more five digit numbers. This number maker helps us to see the value of each digit according to its place. In our number system, each digit has a value depending on its position in the number. For example, in the five digit number 35,313, there are three digits that are a three. But even though it is the same digit. Each one has a different value according to its position. The first digit three is in the place value position of 10,000. So it has a value of 30,000. The second digit three is in the place value position of hundreds. So it has a value of 300. And the third digit three is in the place value position of ones. So it has a value of three ones or three. Now back to my number maker. You can make one of these too. You just need some paper, glue, scissors and a felt pen. I'm making a five digit number. My five digit number is 45,821. 45,821. I'm going to do another one now. 73,000. 
901. Seventy three thousand nine hundred and one. That number has a zero in one of its places. Zero is used as a placeholder, so we can write a numeral correctly. The zero shows there is no amount in that place and helps us to ensure that the other digits are written in the correct place place. We can represent five digit numbers in many ways. So far we have shown them using digits, in words and on a place value chart. Next we are going to show five digit numbers using drawings of base 10 blocks. You may have used these blocks at school. Each drawing of a large cube will represent 1,000. Each drawing of a square will represent 100. Each drawing of a thin rectangle will represent 110. And each drawing of a small cube will represent a one. On the screen, you can see the first representation. It shows 23 thousands, five hundreds, six tens and seven ones. So the number represented is 23,500 and 67. Here is another representation. On the screen are 13 thousands, seven hundreds and one ones. So the number represented is 13,701. There weren't any tens represented. So there is a zero in the tens place. And on the screen is one more. I can see eight tens, 19 thousands, one one and two hundreds. So the number is 19,281. It didn't matter that the representations were in a different place value order. It is still a representation of the five digit number. Today, we have learned many things about five digit numbers. We have learned that they have the place value positions of ten thousands, thousands, hundreds, tens, and ones, and that 10,000 is the first five digit number. We saw that we can represent them on a place value chart, in digits, in words, and using drawings. We have also learned that when there is a zero in a number, it is used as a placeholder. Thanks for joining us today. You might like to make your own five digit number maker and then represent the numbers on a place value chart using drawings or other materials. You could also represent five digit numbers using words and digits. Bye Sally. Bye everyone. Coming up next, we're going to hear from Bob and Bryson, who will share a bit about themselves in our special My Place segment. Check it out. How are you? Good. That's good. 
What's your name? I am Bryson McKenna. Bryson McKenna. Bryson, who's your mob? Um, Camilla Roy and Bundjalung. Camilla Roy and Bundjalung. Deadly. What school do you go to? Shaler Park State School. Shaler Park State School. And what grade are you in at Shaler Park? Year four. Year four. And what's your favourite subject? Math. You like math. Why is math one of your favourite subjects? To be one day, hopefully, be a famous scientist. A famous scientist. OK, all right. And what do you hope to do when you become a famous scientist? Um, probably stop the coronavirus and maybe also stop any viruses that come along, probably. Deadly. That's really good. That's a really good, good dream job to have. So what's your favourite part about being Aboriginal? Um, Aboriginal dancing and having a loving, supportive family. Having a loving, supportive family and Aboriginal dancing. That's solid. What's your favourite part about Aboriginal dancing? Um, the wallaby. The wallaby. The movements or is it a dance? Um, probably the movements. The movements? And why do you like the movements so much? The way it moves is really, really good and, yeah, I think other people should do it. Deadly. That's good. Well, thanks for joining us today. Are you ready everybody? Because we're moving into science. We're about to uncover some cool facts about the sun. Or should I say, hot facts. See what I did there? All right, enough of the bad jokes. Here's Jen. On a cloudless night, away from the bright city lights, we can see millions of stars in the sky. The brightness of stars depends on their size and how far away they are from Earth. Some stars are brighter than others because they are closer to Earth while larger stars tend to shine more brightly than smaller stars. When we observe the night sky, we see that some stars form patterns or constellations that may look like animals, people or objects. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have observed stars and constellations in the night sky for thousands of years. These were, and still are, used as a star map to help navigate the land and waters of Australia. The star map is committed to memory and may be preserved in a songline or paintings to help identify landmarks of cultural and spiritual significance or the location of food, water sources and meeting places. The appearance of particular stars on the horizon may also indicate significant times of the year, such as the beginning of seasons, a ceremony or a time for travel. Traditional owners also use the movement of the sun across the sky to monitor time including the coming and passing of days and seasons. But did you know that the sun is also a large star? Today, we are going to explore some of the features of our sun to understand its relationship to Earth. Let's start with what we already know about the sun. Here are some images of the sun photographed by people on Earth. These images show us that the sun is yellow, very bright, and can be viewed in the sky during the day. Let's take a look now at another image of the sun. This image was not photographed from Earth. It was taken on a NASA satellite, which moves around the Earth in space. In this image, we can observe that the sun is a sphere and is bright orange or yellow in color. In fact, the sun is a large ball of gas. It is located 150 million kilometres away from Earth in the centre of our solar system. The Sun is so big that Earth could fit inside the Sun over one million times. Because the Sun is so big and closer to Earth than any other stars, it shines very brightly in our sky. The planets in our solar system, including Earth, constantly move around the Sun in what we call an orbit. An orbit is the path taken around a star. This path is not circular, but elliptical or football shaped. The Earth orbits or revolves around the Sun in an anti-clockwise direction. It takes Earth one whole year, 365 days and six hours to be exact, to complete one orbit or revolution. This is why our calendars have 365 days. But what about that extra six hours? Well, each year that extra six hours adds up so that after four years, we have a total of 24 hours. 
That means every four years we have an extra day. This is why we have a leap year, 366 days instead of 365 days. Now that we know how the Earth moves around the Sun, let's explore some more of the Sun's features. At the centre of the Sun is its core, where hydrogen and helium gas react to produce energy. There are two types of energy released in these reactions, light and heat energy. The Sun is extremely hot. It has a temperature of approximately 5,500 degrees Celsius at its surface. Your kitchen oven can only reach 250 degrees Celsius. The light and heat energy made by the Sun is released into space and travels to Earth. In fact, it only takes about 8 minutes and 20 seconds for sunlight to travel through space to Earth. But what effect does this sunlight have on Earth? Without the sun's energy, nothing could live on Earth. Plants depend on the sun's light to grow, and animals, including humans, depend on those plants for food. The sun's energy also affects the weather patterns on Earth. The heat provided by the sun warms the land, water, and air. It helps to create wind, which shapes the landscape, and rain, which provides fresh water for plants and animals. So we depend on the sun for lots of things, but it can also be quite harmful. It is important to understand the effects of sunlight so that we can stay safe. The sun's rays are very strong and can permanently damage our eyes. This is why we cannot look directly at the sun. In fact, scientists actually use special telescopes and lenses to study the sun. Too much time in the sun causes sunburn and can lead to skin cancer. We all love spending time outdoors, but Australia has one of the highest rates of skin cancer in the world. So we must remember to slip, slop, slap, seek and slide. Slip on a shirt, slop on sunscreen, slap on a hat, seek shade and slide on sunglasses. The sun can also make some places and times of the day, such as lunchtime, extremely hot. This can make us sick. So we should try to avoid going outside in the hottest part of the day between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m and always remember to drink plenty of water. So whether we are walking the dog, gardening or exercising, we must make sure that we are protected from the sun. Okay, let's recap what we've learnt today. We now know that the Earth moves around the sun in a path called an orbit. It takes one whole year for Earth to complete its orbit. The sun provides light and heat energy, which is essential for all life on Earth. And the sun's energy is strong, so we should always ensure that we are protected when going outside. Now it's your turn. This afternoon, you might like to make a scientific diagram of your backyard that identifies the sun, plants and animals. Or you might like to observe how the shape of a shadow of a nearby tree changes throughout the day as the position of the sun in the sky changes. You could work like a scientist and sketch and label a diagram at different time points in the day. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Okay, let me see a show of hands. Who is ready for a brain break? Are you all ready for some exercise? Well, get ready to move your bodies with some instructions from a person who knows all about the importance of staying fit. Before you do that, I'll say goodbye because Victoria is about to join in today's Learning at Home TV. So I'll see you all next time. Hope you've enjoyed your learning. Hi, I'm Sky Nicholson and I'm a boxer. I'm at home just like you guys. Keeping active is so important for our health and well-being. So let's get active now. This session is a few exercises that we can do to work on our strength and balance. The first exercise I'm gonna run you through is the plank. You wanna start by laying flat on the ground with your hands underneath your shoulders and your toes pointing to the floor. You're gonna lower, you're gonna lower down and then push through your arms to lift your body and you wanna make a straight line from your shoulders to your hips to your toes. You can ask someone nearby to make sure you've got a straight line. Next, we're gonna do the frog rock balance pose. You wanna squat down low with your knees out and your hands flat in front of you. You're gonna rock the weight of your body onto your hands 
and then back onto your toes until you can find balance through your hands. Just like this. And third, we're going to do the stalk stand. We want to balance one leg while the other is placed just above your knee with your knee pointing out. You can help. It's easier if you put your hands on your hips or your arms out. And if that's too easy, you can try the other leg. And if that's too easy, try and bring your hands above your head, just like that. All right, guys, good brain break. Now we can get back to learning.